to keep everyone on schedule, so welcome back to our third and final talk of the day. Uh, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Aliyah Akhtar. I apologize, hope that was good. <laughs> uh, she comes to us from Princeton University where she's a postdoctoral fellow. Um, Aliyah is broadly interested in the interplay of climate, individuals, and ecosystems. Her previous research has focused on modern and ancient sharks, and recently she has started working on Holocene-age terrestrial environments and how they respond to changes in local and regional hydrology. Um, and like I said, she is current, a postdoc at Princeton University on an NSF scholarship. So thank you and welcome. Okay, we can all hear me? Great. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, and thank you for the organizers of this wonderful event. Um, I was a little late coming in, so I missed a lot of the excitement earlier in the day, but I've heard wonderful things and I'm looking forward to catching up later. Um, so as Lauren just said, I'll be talking about what shark teeth can tell us about ancient oceans. Um, I'm not a paleontologist, as like a disclaimer, I just saw a great I'm a paleontologist, what's my, your superpower t-shirt. Um, I'm not a paleontologist, even though I work a lot with fossils. I am a stable isotope geochemist, which is a lot of scary words to a lot of people, and I'm here to hopefully make them a little more um, friendly. A lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today was part of my doctoral work, um, and nothing happens in a vacuum ever. So before I move on, I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge the many advisors, mentors, colleagues, collaborators, and friends who really, um, and funding sources, money, um, who really made sure that everything happened um, smoothly and not too off schedule. Along with being a stable isotope geochemist, I am also a parent, a parent to a four-year-old who is absolutely mesmerized and enthralled by sharks. She would spend hours at the aquarium, um, as evidenced here, just staring at sharks and asking all sorts of questions, as most preschoolers do. Her favorites being why and how, and some der derivative of, of those, usually why, how, how, why, what, when, where. Um, and as a parent, it's really sometimes exhausting answering those questions, but as a scientist, we find ourselves in that position, or I find myself in a position where I am answering these questions in some way or the other. So today, um, we started with our what, what shark teeth can tell us about ancient oceans. We're then gonna go into why, why are ancient oceans important, and why shark teeth, like why, why, why would we even care? We'll talk a little bit about how, how do we use this, this megalodon tooth here, and other similar shark teeth to answer the above questions. And somewhere along the way, we will um, circle around, have a little bit of when, where's. But yeah, so let's start with why. Why are ancient oceans important? Frankly, why are oceans in the present, in the past, and even in the future important? And to answer that question, we'd probably be here for at least a full semester worth of of, of time, but probably an entire dissertation worth of time. So I'm very briefly just going to say ancient oceans are important for, or the ocean in general is important for two things. The first is because it helps regulate Earth's climate and is the reason why the planet today, or our planet in general is habitable, why we have life on our planet. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the other reason is that oceans are are a rich environment where we have a complex um, interaction of species and organisms and individuals in this, in, in the, the ecology and the food web here is incredibly important and helps sustain not just the ocean and keeps the ocean um, healthy, but also life on, on land. Um, so to talk about that first one briefly, the ocean is important because it helps keep the planet habitable. Here's a very simple um, representation, again, we are, a, an entire college course could go towards this. So here's a very simple representation of the global carbon cycle, um, where we have carbon dioxide gas coming out from volcanoes, or, you know, more recently through anthropogenic sources, goes into the atmosphere, mixes with rainwater, help erodes um, minerals and uh, rocks and minerals on land, which then carry on into the sea, deliver alkalinity into the sea, which react with more dissolved carbon dioxide to form carbonate rocks, which then subduct, et cetera. This cycle goes on, and over geologic time, this helps um, keep the Earth, um, it helps modulate the temperature of Earth. 
So that was a simplified version. Here for a second is a chaotic version. And we aren't gonna, we aren't gonna stress out about this too much other than we're gonna remember that carbon goes from, it goes up, in, down, back up. It cycles through. But along with carbon in the green arrows here, we also have blue arrows for calcium and red arrows for magnesium. And today I want to just draw our attention to the calcium arrows. So whoops, sorry, here. So let's talk about the global calcium cycle. In order to understand the global carbon cycle over geologic time scales, we could study carbon, but then we can also study one of these elements such as calcium and magnesium. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about calcium. So calcium is the third most abundant cation in seawater. Um, the sources of calcium to seawater, where does it come from? It comes from, similar to carbon, from the dissolution or the erosion, the weathering of silicate rocks on Earth, shown um, I don't think I have a pointer, but up here where you see mountains and rivers and the river delta leading into the ocean. That's, that's where we're getting calcium into the ocean. We get a little bit of calcium, and that's the, that thick blue arrow. We have the skinny blue arrow showing calcium going in from, from um, uh, ocean axis ridges. That's a smaller flux, so the arrow size is roughly showing you how much calcium you'd be getting from each one of these places. And then the green arrows here are now telling us where calci how calcium is removed from the ocean, so how it's the, what the sinks of calcium from the ocean are. So we have calcium carbonate, cal carbonate minerals, calcite, which exist in two environments, so a neuritic or a shallow platform environment, similar to what we see in the modern-day Great Barrier Reef or the Great Bahama Bank. And then we have a pelagic or deep-sea environment, which is um, where all these little calcifying critters, bugs um, of sorts, form calcium, and that's, that's a considerable portion of where calcium carbonate goes into. Um, so as you can imagine, understanding the calcium cycle over, since it's so intimately related to the carbon cycle, since we can, it's something that we could arguably see in the Bahama Bank or Great Barrier Reef or in um, pelagic calcifying organisms, you would imagine that lots of people have looked at it, and that's exactly true. So, in an attempt to understand what the calcium cycle has looked like over geologic time, folks, many folks, have looked at various different substrates or archives and tried to reconstruct the calcium isotope composition. Um, we'll talk about isotopes in just a second, but here I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there are many different colors and symbols here, and each one of these colors and symbols represent a different type of archive or a different type of um, record that folks have used to reconstruct. So they've looked at barite and corals and brachiopods and carbonates and forams and whole whole slew of things. And this is this is lovely. It has helped guide so much of of our understanding of the of the ocean over the last hundred million years, but it's also raised some more questions than it has answers. So there's two that I'd like to point out. The first is that if we know one of these colors or symbols spans in high enough resolution the entirety of the hundred million year time period that I've shown here. Um, the second is that the different proxies or different archives are sort of giving us different signals. So if we just focus on carbonates, um, we'd imagine that there hasn't really been much change to the calcium isotope um, record over the last hundred or so million years. But then if we look at phosphates and forams and corals, it would imply that maybe a hundred or so million years ago, things were a lot more negative um, than they are, or a lot lighter in isotope space than they are um, in present day. So, Trying to figure out which one of these archives is right, or if we can find a way to, find, to use a different sort of substrate or a different sort of mineral to fill in the gaps um, is where I've come in. So and that's where shark teeth um, have been so wonderful. So sharks have been around since the latest Devonian. The previous slide I showed you was only 100 million years worth of Earth history, but sharks have been around since you know, for the last 380 or so million years, which means that if this archive proves to be um, robust, we could expand seawater reconstru reconstructions to about 350-ish um, or so million years. Continuous record. The second, and this is one of those under debate, kind of, we're figuring things out. Um, from a physiological standpoint, we assume that the way calcium is cycled in, in sharks hasn't really changed over this period of time. So we 
assume that there's little to no change in vital effects or how sharks use calcium and how that would Im what implications that would have for our reconstruction of seawater. Shark teeth are also remarkably abundant and ready readily available in the fossil record. So here I have a picture of a shark, a shark jaw, and this is a, a smallish shark jaw. But what you'll see is that there are multiple rows of teeth in a shark's jaw at any one given time. So whereas for humans where you know, we die and we, we are only really contributing 32 or so teeth to the archaeological record, any one shark would conceivably be giving us hundreds of teeth over its lifespan, which means that if you go to a place that is known for its shark tooth assemblages, you would really and truly be able to scoop up a whole bunch, which means that when it comes to asking museums for samples for destructive analysis, Shark teeth tend to be one of the ones they say yes to. Um, the other thing about, great thing about shark teeth is that they're made of the same kind of stuff that human teeth are, um, and the, which is um, apatite. It's a very, very, um, um, uh, it's a mineral that is, it's, a, it's a phosphatic mineral that is resistant to alteration, um, which is important because anything you're measuring that's a fossil, you would be hoping that it's, preserving a signature that is faithful to the environment or the climate or the time at which it was first precipitated. And apatite is one of those minerals that is very resistant to change. Um, the last and perhaps most important thing about shark teeth is that they are what we call a passive recorder, which if we think back just briefly to the calcium cycle I showed where we had sources from um, you know, weathering silicate rocks on land and some like hydrothermal Vent, venting situations, but our big sinks are carbonate rocks, which are either pelagic carbonates or platform carbonates, such as coral reefs. Sharks were nowhere in that picture, which means that sharks are just existing in the ocean. They are neither a source nor a sink of calcium. They're just passively recording the environment in which they're in, or so we think. So to borrow from one of the gods of geochemistry, Harry Elder, um, uh, the, the Field. This, this proxy confidence factor thing is, is a great metaphor for, I also think, um, any research project where you've like, identified a problem, you've done a little bit of your background reading, you put a, you've got your samples and you're like, oh, I'm going to solve the world, I'm going to help everyone figure everything out, I'm going to finish my PhD in four years. <laughs> no. So that's a why. Let's go to how. How do we use a tooth such as this? Where do we even get them from? Um, and then how do we use it and how do we um, reconstruct or um, anything about ancient environments or the ocean in this case. So sourcing samples, that's the first thing we have to worry about. A lot of our samples come from museum collections, primarily the ones that I've included are, um, or I've studied have been from the Smithsonian um, Institution in Washington DC, the Calvert Marine Museum, which is in Maryland and is um, on, uh, by the Calvert Cliffs, where, which, is, which are one of those great sites um, where you could just like, walk on the beach and find a whole bunch of shark teeth. And then the Academy of Natural Sciences um, at Drexel University. We don't have to go down to the DMV area to find shark teeth. The Rutgers Geology, Geology Museum across the street has a bunch of samples as well, if you're interested in seeing some, um, including um, these wonderful, wonderful specimens of megalodon teeth on, on top. Um, we've also collected some modern shark teeth and soft tissue samples um, through collaborators at NOAA um, who run these um, shark tournament events, things. It's a whole other topic of discussion, but we've got samples from them. They've been very generous. They help us out. And then we've collected some samples by doing field work. This particular picture is from California, but you don't have to go to California or Maryland to look for shark teeth. There's a whole bunch in New Jersey. So shameless butt plug for Monmouth County and a half hour from here, Big Brook Park, which um, is a wonderful place to walk around uh, and just go for a casual family stroll. The, the creek w uh, cuts through the Shark River Formation, which is named because there are so many shark teeth, Paleo, Paleocene, Eocene aged shark teeth there. It's truly one of those scoop up and the sediment in your hand will have a bunch of very little um, teeth. And, and, and they're great, and especially if you go after like a big rain event or a big um, storm event, because it'll um, erode more of the stream bed. So Monmouth County, it's about 25 minutes from here. 
So once we have a tooth, what do we do with it? Um, a little bit of dentistry. And it truly, that's not even me being funny. We have a dental drill. We use it to shave off the enameloid. So the cross, a cross section of a shark tooth looks incredibly similar to the cross section of a human tooth. Where in the middle we have pulp and dentin, and that stuff's spongy and porous, and you don't really want it. It doesn't preserve well in the rock record. But the outer layer is enameloid, and that's that extremely um, um, the highly mineralized um, apatite mineral. Um, and so that's what we preferentially sample for. We use a dental drill, we, we shave it off. We dissolve it in acid, we go through some automated cation separation procedures. This is column chemistry for the chemists in the, in, in the room. Um, because we really, we want to, since I said I'm gonna be focusing on calcium isotopes, I want to I isolate the calcium portion from the rest of the matrix. And then we put it through this multi-collector, um, which is a mass spectrometer, in essence a very big magnet that will help us um, figure out what the different proportions of the different isotopes we have in our standard. This one's called a Neptune, which is very fitting given that we're studying the oceans. Um, we use it for a lot more than just ocean chemistry, but we've always thought that we've had some you know, gods looking over us here. Um, and then once we get our information, we report it in this thing called delta notation, um, which is basically really just, and, and I, I want to define this because I might use it even though I'll try not to too much going down, um, but it's basically the ratio of two isotopes of interest in our sample versus our standard. The standard we like to use is seawater, which means by definition, since we're, if we were to measure seawater, it should be zero per mil because we're normalizing everything to seawater. So I just want you to keep that zero number in, in mind. Like seawater against itself should give us zero. Seawater is zero per mil. And now I've talked about isotopes and I brought up delta and per mil, so let's take a quick second to talk about, to, to, to acquaint ourselves with what, an isot what isotopes are. So isotopes, basically we're looking at the nucleus of, of the atom now and there's going to be varying number of neutrons. So the same number of protons, but a varying number of neutrons. Calcium has six isotopes, one's radioactive, the other are all um, stable. Um, and as I said, we, nor we're, we measure two or three or four in the multi-collector, we measure at minimum like four of these isotopes and we just ratio them. Um, so we do 44 versus 40 is the ratio we use for our sample versus our standard. Why do we care about isotopes, man? Like why, why are we adding more chemical confusion and complication to something that just measure the calcium concentration, just call it a day? Well. Yes and no. Isotopes can be used as chemical tracers. There's valuable information to be had from isotopes that can help us understand natural systems and or aberrations to them when they happen. So for example, here what I'm showing you is it's just a box with you know a handful of 44 calcium isotopes, a handful of 40 calcium isotopes. This is natural, this is their natural abundance. This is what maybe if I were to take a cup of seawater or the, a rock, like without any sort of, this is what I might expect to be in there. However, and the seawater analogy actually works a little bit better here. So we have seawater reservoir A, and from this, we have now precipitated something in reservoir B that has preferentially taken up the lighter 40 isotope, leaving the seawater now with more of the 44. So you can see now how if we start ratioing 44 to 40, in bucket A versus substrate B, we might be able to see a difference in those. So over here in this example, reservoir A is isotopically heavy, it has more of the 44s, versus reservoir B is isotopically light, it has more of the 40s. So being able to make those measurements and look at those differences in those ratios can help tell us things about the processes, about the nature of B, or the rate at which B formed, or if there has been any sort of um, change to what A looked like from which B then formed, et cetera. So one of the founding, so moving on to a little more shark data than a little less chemistry maybe. Um, so one of the founding principles of any work we do in the geological paleo world is that the present is key to the past. So in order for me to be able to tell you anything about what I do with fossil shark teeth, let's take a minute to talk about modern shark teeth. So I'm just gonna take, so I'm just here going to show 
what sort of calcium isotope data we can get from modern shark teeth. Um, just gonna populate this little plot here, and as a reminder, seawater will and should, by definition, always be zero per mil, and that's shown there in the red line. So I measured about 86 modern teeth from a variety of different genera, from a variety of different ocean basins, from a bunch of different places, and this is what we found. So there's a couple of things to, to look at here. The first and perhaps most obvious is that we are average at about minus two, which is two per mil offset from seawater. And here I started saying, hey guys, I want to reconstruct seawater. And we've already run into a problem where shark teeth are two per mil lighter relative to seawater. The other problem is that there's, this is a pretty decent, in calcium isotope space, this one plus-ish per mil range is actually quite large. Um, aberrations to the calcium uh, system usually happen within one per mil. So if, if shark teeth are to be the proxy I use to reconstruct the system, the fact that they are just from a random smattering of individuals and a random smattering of teeth already giving me this, this kind of range is a little bit worrying. And you know, everyone and every PhD student gets really depressed in their third year and that's what happened. Um, the project was awful, it was all gonna fail, nothing was ever gonna come to of it, a dissertation was never gonna be written, etc. cetera. Huh. So, why do modern teeth exhibit large variability in Delta 44? Because we're persistent, if nothing else. And then can we actually use it to extract some environmental or ecological information from this archive? So we're gonna look at, we're just gonna look at the modern tooth data for one more minute. And this time, instead of looking at it in just a random histogram, we're gonna arrange it by different genera. So the modern average, a little um, less than two per mil, is the dotted line here. The gray band shows the entire range we see in the modern. And here I have just split everything by different genera. And you'll notice that some genus types are very, very well constrained, like Isaris all the way over there where we have 11 samples and this very small range, small, base, smaller than our analytical um, uncertainty even. And then there's others like Arcar Highness about two thirds down the screen where I have 25 samples and a one per mil range. And that's actually reassuring to some extent because Carker Highness, and especially these samples, there's about six samples down here in this tail, is these are bull sharks. And who knows about bull sharks? Anything at all. What do, what's so special about bull sharks? They're my favorite type of shark. But bull sharks can live in both marine waters and fresh waters. They can like swim in estuaries, they can swim up river, you can find them in all sorts of crazy environments. So they aren't actually sampling seawater. This is great. For me, this is fantastic. And again, and if I bring back my histogram, the sh bull sharks are the ones that are, are on the lighter end of the spectrum here. Um, and here's this um, work from uh, a different paper where someone measured calcium isotopes in waters along in and around the Florida Keys and Florida Bay, and they found that there is a variety. Uh, there is fresh water will be lighter than seawater, so the salinity scale is um, on the x-axis. The lower salinity is fresh water, um, so those are lighter. So we very easily could have just gotten bull sharks or sharks that in their in their life history for when that particular tooth was being formed, we're hanging out in more freshwater environments. That's reassuring. The other thing that we considered was you are what you eat. And this is, a, um, this is something pretty common in, e e in the world that looks at stable isotopes as an ecological um, proxy. Um, so here's just a schematic of how we expect this to behave, where calcium isotopes, as we approach higher eating orders, or as we go up the food chain, the calcium isotope of the mineralized tissue, in this case, the tooth, would be lighter. And other people have looked into this as well. This is a paper that was published um, a handful of years ago where they um, measured a bunch of shark teeth across. So the, sh um, the trophic level here is depicted in a slightly different way. This is in the fishing world, using a fish base schematic for fish base versus nominal trophic level ends up being something people do and then don't do, but for the interest of here, we're doing it. Um, and they found, and that's kind of what they saw, right? As we're eating at higher, higher um, uh, trophic levels, the calcium isotope of the mineralized tissue is starting to go down. Great. Um, so I imposed all of my data on there. 
And granted, I do not have very many of these lower feeding order shark samples. Most of mine are from the slightly higher feeding order. Um, so if I were to do it again, I would try to find some more. But we A, follow that general trend with some exceptions. And those are these teeth that I would expect to be lighter, highlighted in pink over here, that are actually a little bit heavier. And again, this makes, this actually makes sense. Um, because if you think of sharks that are eating at higher um, feeding orders, they're eating, you know, bigger sharks are eating little, little sharks, smaller sharks. And smaller sharks, if you, lo if you think of where, sharks don't have a skeleton the way we do. Sh sharks have, a, it's cartilage. And cartilage isn't mineralized tissue. It's the stuff like your, your, the depths of your ears are made of, or like your, your nose. That's not mineralized tissue, that stuff. So it doesn't have a lot of calcium in it. So if you think of a shark, an apex predator, great white, what it's eating, a smaller shark, it's not getting very much calcium. So it's not getting enough calcium for us to start seeing that huge signal over there. So it's almost in a very, quest, let's question how well calcium works for trophic level indicator in sharks working out to our advantage for reconstructing seawater-ish. Um, we have other isotopes that, systems that I'm not gonna talk to do about today, but for example, nitrogen and zinc that we can use and have used to um, establish that the trophic level signal is still there and calcium is just the one that's acting weird. And then individual le level variability. And I heard from a friend earlier, who I'm not sure if he's still here, Lincoln, but that Megalodon was his favorite, favorite um, shark. And I'm sure many of you have seen pictures like this, if not jaws like this, where the remarkable thing is the fact that you can, you know, Megalodon's jaw was big enough that you could stand in it and then probably another one of you could stand on your shoulders and it's still, you're doomed, basically. Um, but the thing that ex excites me about the Megalodon jaw picture is, as I said earlier, that sharks have multiple rows of teeth in their mouth at any one given time. So we considered what sort of variability there could be on an individual level. Like, does it matter what tooth I'm taking? Because we know with humans actually it does matter because um, developmentally, for example, there's some teeth that are formed earlier on, some later. So if we do human studies or bovid studies, we prefer the third molar because we know that one has um, erupted um, past the age of, um, past the juvenile stage. So we're like, well, maybe that's something we need to worry about with sharks. Maybe we need to worry about when and where the tooth came from, and it's hard to worry about that in the fossil records. So we're like, well, let's see what sort of variability you would see in a single jaw. So we looked at just that, and we found, well, actually, the variability wasn't that large. So these are three different uh, jaws that I um, studied a bunch of different teeth from, as many rows as we could find. Um, and the variability wasn't that large, but we did the exercise. It was fun. Um, and we have some answers, we don't have some answers, but we're still trying to see, we're, our assumption here is that any re, the range, the variability we see in the modern today is due to some combination of different water masses, is due to some combination of different dietary preferences and behaviors, is due to some, con, uh, some potential input from physiology, um, some juvenile versus maybe adult, some migratory pathways, some, some of that, and our assumption here is that, well, if the present is key to the past, whatever those sources of variability are today, and we may never be able to fully answer them, um, but whatever those sources are today were, uh, of that variability would have existed moving back in time, if assuming we are able to sample a large enough um, st sample size of teeth from a number of different individuals, et cetera. So can we extract any useful environmental information from this archive? So I'm gonna bring us back, this is realism phase, I have to do something. Um, I'll bring us back to the plot that I showed earlier with all the colors, right? This time it's grayed out. And I'm gonna superimpose the shark tooth, um, the, the fossil shark tooth data on here now. So no longer modern teeth, these are fossil teeth. Um, so the left y-axis in blue is the measurement we made on each individual tooth. And then the right y-axis over here is ha the inferred seawater um, value from that. So we basically assume that that two per mil offset is the same through time. Shark teeth will always be, and I can talk a little bit more about why we think it's two per mil exactly um, and why it makes sense for it to be two per mil. But we assume that that two per mil offset is the same. So for everything we got on the left y-axis, we subtracted two and inferred a seawater record. 
And this is reassuring because it doesn't look very different from any of the grave archives we saw. It is noisy though. So we binned, it, we binned everything up in, a ten, in 10 million year bins. Um, we fit a moving average through all of it and we tried to reconstruct seawater here where we have, um, sorry, where we see that at about, and the modern day, everything is averaging around zero per mil. We have our variability, but as we move in, as we move back a hundred or so million years ago, there is a decrease, or rather, if I were to say that in a slightly different way, is towards the present, there has been an increase in the calcium isotope composition of seawater. So, well, what causes this observed increase? Um, why is seawater heavier today than it was 60 or 80 or 100 million years ago? And we believe this has everything to do with changes in the locus of carbonate sedimentation, which then goes into a carbonate diagenesis story. So as I said earlier, carbonate sedimentation or carbonate sinks are either in platform or neuritic environment or deep or pelagic environment. And we believe the partitioning currently, about, it's about 50-50. So 50% 50 of all the world's carbonate production happens in platforms like the Bahamas or the Belize carbonate platform or um, the Great Barrier Reef, and 50% happens in more pelagic deep sea environments. Going back into time though, that was probably over the 100 or so million years that I've studied, that was probably more of a 90-10, where we had more Bahamas, more you know, places to escape the New Jersey cold from in January and February environments. Um, and that has profound implications for how, um, what seawater is looking like. And when we, so this is a, stu a study that was published in 1988 that showed that there has been a change in the platform area on, on the planet. And when we convert what we see from um, their reconstruction and we try to model fit it through my data, which now for ease of simplicity of streamline and just put the red, like the red circles, which are the moving average. When we model that through, that model fit actually works pretty well with error. So we think that that's probably what's causing that increase. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, I could read through these, I could leave these up, give us more time for questions, what we're thinking, but shark, shark tooth enamel, enameloid, that's what we really call it, is a great archive for seawater chemistry. Probably not so much for reconstruction, re reconstructing trophic levels and ecology in its, in its, if we just look at calcium, but if we start thinking about other isotopes, um, which again, as a stable isotope geochemist, the more isotopes, the better. Um, when I start thinking about all these other systems, then yes, we could start putting together uh, entire trophic levels and ecosystems, and we could start talking about how different periods of time where, um, um, you know, how, how the, organisms and individuals were responding to different stresses in the marine environment. Um, but for today, we're just going to say that they, they work really well for reconstructing seawater, and we're able to record an increase in seawater delta 44 values over the last 100 million years, which is an agreement with independent archives um, that I showed earlier, including well-preserved corals and bulk carbonates. And this increase is probably due to changes in the calcium isotopic composition of the global marine sink, which is another way of saying where carbonates are being buried is very important for what the ocean system looks like. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Comments, concerns? Yes? Uh, it just occurred to me that, that basically you're using the shark's teeth to get ocean chemistry. Yes. Okay. I'm wondering if... Uh, Notice anything, say, at the end of the Cretaceous period when the whole chemistry of the sea changed? Does any of that become obvious through the shark's teeth, or was it just a mouthful? Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned the end of the Cretaceous. So there, there's two answers to that question. The first is that sharks are remarkably resilient pesky creatures and they survived all the sorts of like you know mass extinctions and stressors to the marine system um there are some species of course that go extinct but for the most part sharks as a whole elasma branchi they're they're around so that's thing number one so which um and i say that because we want to make sure that they aren't feeling a lot of stress and that stress is not affecting their geochemistry on a physiological level um, and they're recording seawater 
So yes and no, around 66 million years ago, you will notice is incidentally the period of time where I tend to have the least amount of data. Though, I, yeah. So yes and no, we do see there are certain shark to the deposits that I have looked at where the end Cretaceous, the chemistry does get a little out of sorts. Um, things are not giving us, like they aren't falling into what we'd expect the long-term 10 million year. That's the other thing is I've min binned everything by 10 million years, primarily because there are periods of time where I have less um, co like data coverage. So things aren't falling within them. We don't have as many samples though for me to be able to say anything conclusively, but the little we've looked at from, um, so we have some samples from Arkansas, some from North Carolina, and some from um, the Mediterranean. Um, basin and those are a restricted basin so they aren't open ocean chemistry but they are looking a little weird yeah yes um, oh sorry do you have any hypotheses about what caused the sudden dip in um, carbonates in seawater about 45 million Oh yes, this is called, okay, so the mid Mesozoic, it's called the mid Mesozoic like pelagic revolution. And it's all those like little pelagic calcifying critters I showed way at the start. They, there was a huge, like there was a radiation, a proliferation in, the, in their abundance and their biomineraliza biomineralization or the mechanism by which they biomineralized. So yeah, so that's like the one for why pelagic stuff went up and then of course because you only have like so much um it's a finite sort like finite amount of calcium if you have more guys sucking it out you have less that can go in around this time we also probably have you know there's there's that's going to be my my less speculative answer there's a more speculation answer where i can talk about shallow stuff but for pelagic yeah it's called the mid mesozoic pelagic revolution and that happens at um, in the 50 to 45 ish million year mark. Yes, paleontologist superpower. I love that shirt. Okay, I know uh, sharks can be pretty tough fossils. Yes. Okay, uh, they're fairly easily uh, reworked, i.e., eroded <coughs> from one geologic formation to another. The case in point is Big Rock, where you've got um, the Winona Formation, which is. Uh, it's uh, upper Campanian, and the strongest conformity, then you have the basal lavasing, which is lower restricting. You can rework shark's teeth from one formation to the other, and you get a mixture of both in the creek. I was just wondering about your time constraints. Is that oh, better, yes. or are you working with bigger time constraints? Oh, it matters immensely. Um, which is why I very rarely trust any teeth that I collect myself. I rely on things that we get from the museum where someone has given me some sort of, so that's why the Smithsonian ended up being so critical to doing this work, where they gave us like, this was collected in this location by this person and this is the stratigraphic unit. So we have some stratigraphic unit ages. But then again, as I said, isotope geochemist, I, we, we just love doing this. I don't think I have a slide here. I might not. But we can use, we can measure the radiogenic strontium isotopes in the enamel of shark teeth. And there is a very, very good strontium isotope curve of seawater that has publi been published and exists. And we basically match it up to make sure, we make sure that the, do the stratigraphic age that has been provided to us for each tooth matches up with what we're seeing in the strontium um, isotope derived age. And if it is, then great, we proceed. We include it in our compilation here. And if it doesn't, that tooth is immediately rejected as having probably been reworked or um, altered by a diagenesis. So we had to screen these teeth. There was about maybe, I think, like six or 7% of the total number of teeth I analyzed had to be tossed out for that reason. Great question, thank you. Sorry, yes? Predict the, the increasing acidification of our oceans. Oh. Uh, the depth might have an effect on the calcium carbonate uptake. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the CO2 levels rising, the increasing acidification uh, doesn't eat shellfish. Yeah. So. So. Um. 
Hmm. Because of the fact that sharks have to maintain osmoregulation, which is a form of like homeostatic regulation where they need to maintain a very um, specific, so again, similar to humans, right? We have to maintain our internal body chemistry within very confined ranges. And if not, then you, know, you need dialysis, similar for sharks. The renal system, um, a combination of the gills and the renal system work to make sure that the calcium concentration or the inside the organism is maintained within very narrow um, bounds. So if anything, I would say that it would potentially skew off, as I said, okay, so let's take a step back to when we talked about isotopes in different reservoirs. And I said, one of the things that we could get at is that reservoir A, that blue box is starting to look a little different. So if we have more acidification, that could arguably change what the composition of reservoir A is. So even though sharks are still probably within some level of stress doing something similar to what they've always done, so reservoir B is precipitating in the same way it always has, in this case, the tooth, the composition of A might change. So that might be something that we do worry about down the line. But other than that, there are more regulation should maintain. It should maintain. Um, it should maintain concentration. Um, for calcium, um, because if not, again, osmo like the, their cells would lysize and it would be like catastrophic. Um, on an end of, yes, I mean, what what's happening in the oceans might end up being catastrophic for sharks, like in general. Like you know, these 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 guys have survived everything we've thrown at them for 350 million years, except for humans, right? Um, this might end up being stressful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Zero million years ago, you have a lot of data. Oh, yes. So that's all the modern stuff. Yeah, well, if you spread that out, could you spread it out by thousands of years or something? And no, so modern, for a lot of modern teeth, now that's where one of those, like it does get tricky. For a lot of modern teeth, we are told that this is modern um, and so the strontium isotope curve for this period of time ends up, our analytical precision on that measurement ends up being larger than the um, what we'd expect to see on that sort of like time scale for we're looking at a couple of hundred um, to a couple of thousand years. So everything in there is probably like the last, you know, three to five-ish um, um, thousand years, but no, I don't have an age model for being able to refine it. There are, there are techniques we could use where there's a lot of work that has been going into folks measuring like U-series dating um, off appetitic, appetite minerals. It hasn't been bio, mineral, like bioappetite minerals, it's been more abiotic appetite minerals, but there, that is an active and ongoing work um, line of research that folks are doing. And maybe sometime down the line, we could be able to put some of these samples on there, but not for the, not right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes? I'm, I'm just curious about uh, sharks, these are, uh, are a great source, but it seems to me that there are other sources of calcium, and uh, there are Oh, absolutely. So that's one of the things that we I have done here is that I do have um, corals. They're the little in gray here. They're they're squares. They show up often, and they were one of the archives that well preserved coral. So coral is a notorious for getting reworked as after, after it has been deposited. So it gets altered by a diagenesis. So finding well-preserved coral is tricky though with more um, geochemical and screening tools, people have been able to do it. So compared to the reconstruction of seawater to that, like shark teeth compare remarkably well with that archive. Um, so yeah, thing number one. But the other thing for coral, which is can get tricky sometimes is coral is a huge, um, fraction of that neuritic or platform carbonate sink, calcium sink um, term. Um, so if you have someone that's an active player in a global geochemical cycle, then sometimes there's a little bit of bias involved for using it to reconstruct the cycle. So you want to, that's why using the, like, um, something like coral with something like shark teeth, which are a passive recorder, and both agreeing and converging on the same answer is, in my opinion, at least a great approach. Yes? Yeah, so we have looked at. Fresh water, like 
Yep. Yeah. So we have looked at some manatee, um, uh, some manatee teeth. Um, we've actually also looked at some barnacles on like whales. Um, it's, they've been a little bit harder to get our hands on than shark teeth. But as you said, since manatees can be in fresh water, the bull sharks ended up being a happy accident. I use the word happy loosely. We were trying to avoid anything that would be in fresh water. Our, our original goal was to just be able to study seawater because the calcium residence time in seawater is about a million years. So the understanding is that regardless of where you get your tooth from, like what ocean basin, it should be the same at any one given point in time. The calcium isotope should be the uh, value should be the same at any one given point in time because the residence time of calcium is so long. Um, and that was important because, as I said, there's other isotopes we can use for trophic reconstructions, most notably nitrogen isotopes. And nitrogen isotopes vary vastly in, um, across ocean basins and like, you know, ocean depths. So we were trying to use the calcium in conjunction with that as a way to maybe subtract out what the baseline would have been. And then bull sharks happened. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, your data is from a pretty wide area of time. Were you able to see any speciation in the shark's teeth? Um, you know what? I think I actually have a slide that might help us there. Yeah, OK. So um, so we're looking at a bunch of modern or extant teeth and a bunch of fossil teeth. And there's a uh, fossil teeth. And there's some you know species that have persisted through this period of time and some that have gone extinct. So one that has persisted, and I've thrown up here, which is Isurus, and we had enough, um, enough samples to be able to do a reconstruction like this. So the dark blue squares here are the ones that were just from um, Isurus, um, the Isurus genus, and have been corrected with just the Isurus um, correction from the modern. And we see that, again, it's falling really well within um, what the broad inferred seawater is. Yeah. Sure. Two more questions. No pressure. Yes. Um, I'll ask a question that's a little odd. Okay. Is there, we saw your prior person talked about you know, giving a nod to Jurassic Park. With the nod to that and using computational analytics, is there any possibility of getting any fragments of um, DNA from inside a shark? Oh my goodness. I'm way too far gone. Hmm. So if I'm the wrong person to ask that question. <laughs> I have no idea. That's fascinating. I have absolutely no idea. Um, what I will say, though, is that for a lot of shark teeth and the fossil record especially, the amount of material we have, like the enamel layer, the tooth is small and the enamel layer is pretty thin. So if this ends up being something that requires a large amount of um, material, we might run into some challenges. Because of course, when you're in a, like, you know, out in the field, you're collecting teeth, you could find a bunch of like, oh, these are like five megalodon teeth, but we don't know if they're from the same individual or not. So we got necessarily mixed samples. But that's a great question. And, and, and I will be sure to find someone who might be able to answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Is, uh, is there any uh, difference in these isotope ratios between juveniles and adults are the same species or the same type of Oh, not that one. That's a great one. Um, yes and no. Oh, so the question is, is there any indication that there would be a difference in the isotope ratios for the same sort of individual or taxon, but in a juvenile versus adult population? And that's a great question, and it's a yes or no answer, because everything we know in theory about how physiology would um, be affected suggests that there may be, but everything we've been able to measure hasn't necessarily shown us that. And that has, I think, in large part to do with the fact that we just don't have the right sort of samples, because it's been, yeah. Um, so we are working with some folks right now who they have like 
So in order to be able to do this very well, it needs to be one of those like controlled, we need to control for the environment, we need to control for the diet, and we need to make sure that the only thing that would be changing is the shark growing up. So we have some folks, um, some coll collaborators in an aquarium um, who do have like juvenile sharks and over years as they mature, we know that the environment is the same, we know that the diet will only be changing according to what the dietary needs of the shark are, not as in, oh, today I found a manatee to eat versus today I'm going to eat another baby shark. Um, but yeah, so we haven't been able to measure it, but maybe. Thanks. Thank you everyone for coming to the open house this year. The mineral sale will be open for a little bit longer um, and the museum will be open until about four o'clock today. So thank you again for coming and hopefully we'll see you next year or before then. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.